the first cable car in the world. It traveled down the Clay Street Hill in San Francisco on August 1, 1873. Its inventor, Andrew Halliday, a wire rope manufacturer whose concept provided both a solution to one of San Francisco's first urban transportation problems and at the same time created a new market for his company's product. In time, the cable car system would grow to more than 55 miles of road through San Francisco's streets under the management of nine different companies. Cities across America and around the world found cable traction the perfect solution to their mass transportation problems. The development of electric traction streetcars marked the end of the steel cable as a dominant means of mass transit and soon only 4.7 miles of cable railroad remained in the world, all in San Francisco. After 109 years of more or less continuous operation, the world's first and only remaining cable traction street railroad rattled, screeched, and clanged to a halt. In the early morning drizzle, decorated with flowers, banners, and cheering patrons, the last cars rolled into the car barn at the corner of Mason and Washington to be off the streets of San Francisco for 21 months. Moments later, the main power switch was ceremoniously thrown and the massive drive motor's power waned. The huge bull gears and sheave wheels groaned to a halt. More than 10 miles of cable went slack and the city fell into a rare silence. No bells, no ringing pulleys, no steel wheels pounding worn crooked rails. On the very day after the celebrated shutdown, work began on the massive task of rebuilding with the most modern methods and materials, one of the oldest working transportation machines in the world. It was to be smoother, safer, and more reliable, but it had to look the same, sound the same, and last another 100 years. When the reconstruction began, the cable car barn at Mason and Washington Streets was virtually the same as when first rebuilt in 1908 after having been destroyed by the post-earthquake fire in 1906. Consistent with the people's caveat to make it safe, make it efficient, make it last, but keep it the same, the exterior walls of the old buildings were buttressed and shored to create a shell within which the winding mechanism was to be completely modernized. Modernization began with the dismantling and removal of the old motors, sheaves, and bull gears. With the walls held fast and the interior stripped bare, top and bottom, the rebirth could begin. They had the, the Muni had problems with safety as well as the amount of unscheduled shutdown on the project. The, uh, there were, the system was not running as efficiently as it should be. We had premature wears of the pulleys and of the cables. We had uh, excessive amount of, uh, of, of breakdown that would require a special amount of patchwork. The, the original barn had uh, a lot of spaces, but it was not fully used to its maximum. We're adding a lot of new rooms, administrative offices. We've lengthened the tension runs uh, so we can get extra usage out of the, uh, the cables. And basically, the system would be more, uh, would be smoother, safer, and more efficient. The brick walls of the old powerhouse were to be preserved, but had to be made earthquake safe. This was accomplished by reinforcing the outer walls with an interior frame of structural steel, forming an intricate truss system designed to resist seismic loads. The office floors and additional mezzanines were built on an internal structural steel frame supported by a perimeter of 36-inch diameter steel reinforced concrete caissons sunk to a depth of 70 feet. The successful completion of the car barn on time for the June 1984 reopening 
was not without its share of unpredicted problems. Early this year, as most people are aware, we had a very excessive uh, rainy season and the contractor consequently lost about six weeks' time on his schedule for the barn, which is what everybody is worried about being done by June 1st, 1984. And at that point, we had to assess what we could do to catch up and get back on schedule. So we had the contractor start a program of acceleration, and for about two months, he worked 60 hours a week and we set ourselves a goal for when we wanted to get our structural steel started and we managed to reach that goal with the acceleration program and started the steel early in July. The old barn became the new barn by a process that left a structure looking virtually the same as the original. The roof was removed, the inside gutted, floors were added, rooms enlarged and open areas enclosed. Wherever new external walls were built, the bricks were chemically cleaned and matched to the originals. When the work was completed and the scaffold stripped from its sides, the old ferries and Cliff House Railway powerhouse betrayed nothing of its total newness. A preservationist triumph, but not without its cost. When the contractor installed the wall bracings on, for the exterior wall, it created some construction problem with respect to the actual demolition work of the roof and the second level floor. It also created problems with drilling the caissons as well as the installing of the structural steel. Uh, I would say we're, we're talking about a six months difference uh, if we had originally knocked the the original building down, but being that it's a historical landmark, that couldn't be done. And we are talking perhaps as much as a million dollar extra to, to salvage the, to save the original walls. But inside, things are really different. While the winding machinery looks much the same with its bull gears, winding wheels, and tension run, it is truly a state-of-the-art cable traction railway powerhouse. Brand new 510 horsepower, Variable speed DC electric motors turn the wheels that pull the cable through the streets. The length and tension run will extend the working life of the cables. Uncompromised safety is ensured by a sophisticated electronic system that monitors the operation of the winding machinery as well as mechanical functioning throughout the system. Even the landmark smokestack cut in half by the great earthquake and abandoned when the switch was made from steam power to electricity, was reinforced and recalled to service as the main ventilation shaft. Work on the roadbed began immediately. The newest techniques and equipment were called into action. The sonic blaster, a high-tech ditch digger that uses sound vibrations to plow a giant tooth through almost any surface began ripping up streets to prepare for the replacement and relocation of sewer pipes and other utilities to make way for the total replacement of the old, worn, and twisted rails. But long before actual construction could begin, problems had to be solved on the drawing boards and in the laboratories. At San Francisco State University, Professor of Engineering Peter Felzer began looking for better lubricants and better cable gripping materials in mid-1981. At San Francisco State, we investigated two, uh, two different aspects of the problem. We tried a variety of different grip materials as well as a variety of cable lubricants. And again, the, the attempt was to minimize cable wear and, or increase the life of the cable as well as to increase the life of the die materials themselves. The dies are the replaceable parts of the cable car grip that actually grab hold of the moving cable and put the car into motion. In the past, because of the severe wear caused by the friction of the cable moving through the grips, the dies had to be replaced about every four days. The challenge was to find a die material that would last longer but not damage the cable and to find a cable lubricant to replace the pine tar that had been used since the system opened. Did the laboratory testing pay off? Chevron Research Company, in collaboration with Professor Felzer, developed a new lubricant formula called High Grip. The test results indicated High Grip is slippery enough to allow smooth cable car startups and protective enough 
to reduce wear and extend the useful life of both cable and grip without gumming up the works like the old pine tar lubricant. Now comes the final test, the test of time. This is a laboratory. It's not the uh, cable car system. Do you have to do full-scale testing or testing in the system as a final validation of your, of your laboratory results? For the grip dies, 100 years of technology offered nothing better than the original material. Not one substitute tested in the laboratory offered a hope of improvement. The tried and true was still the obvious choice. The, uh, the trackway generally was in a very bad state of uh, repair. Although uh, Muni had made very brave efforts to keep it running, the system was 100 years old and was uh, deteriorating very quickly, almost impossible to, to keep uh, maintained. The understructures were, were crumbling. The rails were coming loose from the understructures. The rails themselves were very worn. Uh, and there were several, well many in fact, different types of rail which had uh, been generated throughout the hundred years history. So in all, the, uh, the different rails, the worn rails, the, uh, the fact that the rails were coming loose was making it extremely difficult, so it was decided that was the time to try to uh, save on maintenance costs and redesign a, a new system. Removing and replacing the old rails and underground machinery required a total reorganization of the understreet. Sewer pipes, water lines, phone and power cables, all had to be relocated before actual track work could begin. First, all the old rails were ripped up and scrapped. Then the excavation began for the trackway structure, substructure, and the larger substructure for the sheave pits and turntables. Concrete foundations anchored the rebar and steel forms. The slotted rail was pinned and shimmed precisely into place and concrete was poured to form the single unit rail foundation and traction cable conduit. The rails came in 60 foot sections and were formed into one long seamless ribbon by an ingenious process called thermite welding. This advanced technique actually casts a new section of rail between the 60 foot lengths, molding them into one continuous piece to form an extremely strong, smooth, continuous rail that is very rigid, absorbs expansion through compression, and completely eliminates the problems of misalignment at the gaps of conventionally joined rails. Finally, the rails are completely encased, except for the running surface, in reinforced concrete to produce a roadbed of great strength that will be smoother than ever before and should last another 100 years. Immediately after shutdown, the entire 34-car fleet was transported to Pier 70, where they were stored before and after restoration, and where most of the truck overhauling was done. Most of the chassis and body restoration was done in Muni's specially equipped cable car shop. There, the first step, complete dismantlement, revealed a not unexpected but still hard to believe degree of decay. In some cases, so little of the original material was left that portions of cars were virtually nothing but paint and trim. When we brought the cars into the shop, we immediately began to dismantle. Uh, we found out uh, wood rot, rust extensively throughout the cars. Uh, a lot of them were just hanging together by, through paint and uh, masking tape, uh, if you will. Uh, they need considerable work, carpentry work, steel work, welding, painting, sheet metal, and just a whole host of things to uh, put them back in the condition that we so want them to. Naturally, cable car parts are hard to find. The last cable car parts store went out of business a long time ago. So, just about everything had to be custom fabricated. And except for heavy foundry work, such as the casting of 360 new wheels, virtually all original design fabrication was done in Muni's own shop. A team of carpenters and cabinet makers authentically reproduced doors, benches, and window frames whenever there was too little left to salvage. Many cars needed complete structural frame replacement. 
Wherever there was rot, mold, or fungus, the original material was replaced by a new custom-made and fitted part. Steel parts were removed, cleaned, and repaired, and when necessary, refabricated from scratch. Glaziers matched, cut, and installed new windows and roof lights. Sashes were refitted and made to work like new. Siding, roofing, flooring, everything was brought up to spec. No detail was overlooked. At Pier 70, mechanics rebuilt the trucks and refitted them for the new rails being laid in the streets. Part of the truck replacement and repair is the exchange of wheels, which we uh, is a new uh, uh, type of wheel. It's, uh, the tread is wider and the flange is deeper to accommodate the new rail. Uh, this truck here is a Powell-type uh, rear truck, and it houses uh, uh, levers and rods and bearings, the track brake uh, mechanism, the slot blade mechanism, and the uh, wheel shoe mechanism. All of these parts are either replaced or repaired, and so when they are assembled, we have a complete reconditioned and overhauled truck. With like new chassis mounted on rebuilt and modernized rolling gear, the cars were ready for the paint shop. Here they were sanded smooth, scraped, puttied and primed, sprayed and brushed to look just like always. All the traditional colors of paint and stain were used. The exteriors were dominated by the familiar maroon, buff, blue and white, with details trimmed in gold and black. One by one, all 34 cars were dressed, ready and waiting for the big day. The day when all San Franciscans could say at last, they're back. As with the powerhouse and the track and the street, the goal was to make the cars better, make them safer, but keep them the same. But the men and women who were doing the job were just humans, and human creativity cannot be denied. Some things had to change just for the sake of change. We have changed the formula of the gongs and uh, we've gone to a naval bell material that will give the cable car uh, gong a uh, San Francisco's own pitch and you'll recognize that throughout the world. Almost everything had been done. Muni crews were in the streets laying the cable, checking the track, pulleys, sheaves and depression beams, lubricating and inspecting. By this time, everybody knew that San Francisco's famous cable cars would be back on time. With 56,500 feet of new cable strung under nine miles of new track, the system was ready for final testing, and the giant wheels and gears began to turn anew. San Francisco began to sing again. For the first time in 22 months, the cable car's heart began to beat at the corner of Washington and Mason and the pulse of the city could be heard beneath the streets once more. Inside the powerhouse, only the very knowledgeable noticed the real changes. To most, it just appeared new, clean, and uncluttered. While it all looked the same, as decreed, the four new 510 horsepower, adjustable speed DC drive motors, longer tension runs, and new winding wheels promised more reliable and efficient operation added modern electronics like this programmable computerized controller along with the old tried and true like this simple but reliable cable strand sensor ensured a new standard of safety for the second hundred years. Festivities began in a modest way on June 4, 1984 when a small band of reporters, dignitaries, construction workers and muni personnel gathered on the edge of Chinatown for the dedication of the brand new, looks just like the old, cable car barn and powerhouse. Well, did you ever think it would get done? Yeah. See the optimists? Absolutely. We all thought it would get done, and of course it did. And what you're seeing here today is the cable car barn, which really, in a sense, is the home of the system. This is an $18 million job, and the restoration is in fact a perpetuation of the way it was some 87 years ago when it went through its second transformation. We're delighted to be here. The cable cars are on time, as you know, 
Uh, the California Street Line opened yesterday. But most importantly, and I hope the real tenor of this, is to thank everyone that made it possible, particularly the residents who put up with the most incredible dirt and noise for some 20 months. And I would just like to say thank you, everyone who lives along this line. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. The second, yeah, give them a round of applause to the residents. <laughs> then secondly, we'd like to thank the people who actually worked on this edifice. Would you raise your hands? Where are the workers? Let's hear from you. Make a noise. Hi, Carl. Do something. Thank you very, very much for all of your effort. And thirdly, I'd like to thank the Muni Railway, in particular the Public Utilities Commission, Chin and Hensolt, everyone who oversaw this effort to make sure that it happened. The dim sum and champagne reception, fireworks and dragon dance were a tiny hint of the celebration to come. Thursday, June 21st, 1984. 22 months to the day after shutdown, they were back. The city that knows how to party was going to party as never before. The freshly painted cable cars rolled out of the brand new old barn down the gleaming virgin tracks to queue up for the official startup of America's cable cars. The only remaining cable traction street railroad in revenue service in the world and our nation's only national historical landmark on wheels. <laughs> Cable cars are back. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel wonderful. What's because it? because then we can ride around the city uh, with less effort. You know, it's hard to fit these things in a taxi. You know the problem I have? I think it's great. He wasn't talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, think so great it's about it. I think it's beautiful. I think it's an asset to the city. It's a trademark. It's really beautiful. I think it's great. It's nice to have them going up and down the hills again. It brings a lot more people around to see, the, you know, this is what you come to see, this is going to see, it's cable cars. One of the things you come to see. <laughs> a lot easier to get up the hill. While the masses played in the streets, the dignitaries again gathered in the car barn to recognize the contributions of the many people and organizations of the coalition that made the $60 million dream come true. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a day that really was. All day long, those of us that were out there saw, I think, at least a half a million people enjoying the cable cars and taking such a sense of pride in our city that we did something right. It was on time, it was on budget, and it really was a form of a huge civic celebration. People put up with all kinds of problems with very few complaints, and I, for one, appreciate it so much.
It's great to be part of, you know, something that's going to be history. <laughs> They're thrilling. No it's sound like, like that in Philadelphia. History. It is not a page out of history, yes. Oh, everyone knows about the cable cars. We're from Pennsylvania. <laughs> we were just here on our honeymoon and found out that that was when they were starting up. But San Francisco without them. Yes, they were on time. That no one can deny. But under budget, some think not, with some unsettled bills yet to be paid. And the innovations, only time will tell. But one thing is for sure, they're back.